things we want to add to this. So let's pray. Our Father, we come into your presence once again. We thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we thank you that he is the central person uh, in your word, uh, that from the Old Testament to the New, uh, prophetically in the Old Testament and fully realized in the New, uh, it was always about him and the work that he would accomplish at Calvary. And so, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for your word and for uh, the fact that it has been preserved and kept for us over the years. Uh, we thank you that we can go to it for our edification, for our encouragement, uh, perhaps for our exhortation. And so, our Father, we just pray that you would um, bless our time together as we open your word once again. We do ask these things in our Savior's precious name. Amen. Um, I'm going to do one thing because I have a fan on. I'm in my windowless basement and I have my uh, dehumidifier on. There we go. And it sounds like a lot of wind and machinery running in the background. So very good. So we're getting to this last section. We've spent a lot of time in First Peter talking about about suffering, especially fo the focus on the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as the suffering that we can anticipate uh, as we serve the Lord, as we follow him. Um, the Lord has demonstrated through his own life, through the example of his life, how we should respond to suffering. And, uh, and that was through submission. And so the last couple of weeks, we've talked about submission, submitting to one another, submitting to uh, authorities and to employers and, and so on. And um, <clears throat> But tonight we're going to go in the final study of First Peter. Uh, we're going to see how service for the Lord is a direct result of a, a life of submission to him, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's go to our passage now. We've got a lot of verses to read, so I'm going to split it again. Uh, we're going to start, uh, as I said last week, kind of in the middle of a thought in verse 10 of chapter 4. And we'll start reading there at verse 10. And we read, as, we, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then verse 12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of the glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? <clears throat> Verse 18, now if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. And so we'll um, just share our screen and then uh, we'll, we'll go in here. And um, when we get to that portion, we'll, um, we'll read the next part or the final part of our lesson tonight. So that's where we are now. First Peter chapter four, verse 10 to the end. And then we're going to go on to chapter five in just a couple of minutes. So we're thinking here of service. Uh, and the first thing that uh, the Apostle Peter begins to talk about is stewardship. And he talks about how stewardship uh, comes about um, and, uh, and what uh, we can expect from being good stewards. And so in verse 10, we see here that the gifts come directly from God. As we started that verse, it began with the little word as, as each one has received a gift. Now, Wiest would tell you that that little word 
is better translated or better understood as in whatever quality or quantity you receive, whatever quality or quantity you receive. And so everybody receives gift, uh, but it does come to some in different, uh, it comes to everybody in the appropriate amount, the appropriate quality and the appropriate amount. The word gift itself that we find here in the New King James and, and other translation as well is not the normal word that is used for gift in the New Testament. And so the word used implies that it's a spiritual gift, not a material gift. It's something that's given, provided by God for a very specific purpose. Now, we talked about this a little bit a few weeks ago. Most believe that spiritual gifts are given at salvation but then developed over time. It's a spiritual gift. It's something that's been imparted to us by the Holy Spirit. And so it's something that we cannot fully utilize uh, when we're early saved, uh, but it's something that uh, it can be. It can be a supernatural thing that we suddenly have an ability we didn't have before. But more often, it's something that develops over time and becomes more mature as we mature. Um, in other places, uh, we are told that some desire the best gifts. Uh, and so that's something that we can perhaps receive other gifts later as we are matured in the faith. Perhaps there are other gifts that might be given to us. But again, it's not something that if we desire it, we'll get it. Again, it's the hand of the Lord, the provision of this gift that comes to us. And so we see that in verse 10. Um, it also says, as we mentioned, all gifts are given for a purpose. We find that in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7 to 11. It gives a list of some of the gifts and several other places as well. The one thing that we do know is that these gifts are not given for our own profit, for our own enjoyment, even though we may enjoy them. They're not primarily given for our enjoyment or for our glory, certainly. They're given to serve the body of Christ. All those gifts are to serve the body of Christ. The other question that we raised a few weeks ago, and we can talk about more as we finish, is, is there a difference between spiritual gift and a talent? Um, and yes, there is. Uh, people who are unsaved, people who are not even believers, very often have a talent. Uh, but a talent can also be used uh, in order to uh, worship the Lord, to serve the Lord. It can be used as a gift if it's developed properly and, and carefully, and we ensure that it is God that's getting the glory and not ourselves. <clears throat> um, God gives us talents. If we're believers, we, if we surrender those talents to his use, uh, he can use them. And so there is a purpose to them. And then the thing we see here in verse 11, a spiritual gift is given to, to be used for God's glory and for the building up of other believers. <clears throat> but it's also something that we do for God. Uh, it says there in verse 11, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles, the oracles of God. Uh, the word oracle comes from the root word logos, uh, meaning the word and especially the word of God. So when we speak, we speak from the word of God. We don't speak in our own right. We don't speak in our own authority. We speak the word of God. And if we minister, it says there, <clears throat> we read in that verse, we minister with the ability which God supplies that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And so we speak, we minister for the glory of God and to acknowledge his power and his authority in our lives. And so that's how we begin uh, stewardship, uh, serving the Lord. Uh, and submitting to the Lord. It's for the body of Christ, but for the glory of God. The second thing, we, very quickly, we come back to the topic of suffering again. Uh, and so Peter has to always be reminding them of, of suffering that seems to be waiting in the wings. But again, he does it in the context of our gifts. And so Peter begins this section re referring to the believers as beloved. That's a term of great affection, great uh, fondness for these believers. Uh, he loved them just as the Lord loves them. And so he says, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. He reminds him again of the suffering that he's referred to in every single chapter 
uh, of our study so far. Here he calls it a fiery trial. And there's an interesting thought behind a, the fiery trial. Sometimes when we think of a fire, we think of something like a forest fire, something that burns out of control. Uh, it destroys everything in its path. That's not the type of fire that we're talking about. Uh, it's This is rather a controlled burn with a purpose. And uh, any of you who've grown up in rural areas, you'll know that that's something that they used to do. We saw it all the time in, uh, in Africa. Uh, very often they would set fires uh, under very careful supervision uh, in order to drive out uh, snakes and other things before they did planting and before the next year came in. They were control burns. They were in order to keep the, um, the grass and other things down so they wouldn't catch fire. And so this fiery trial is something that is with a purpose. In Proverbs 27 and verse 21, and we've kind of touched on this a little bit back in chapter one, we read the same word which we use regarding this fire. Uh, that verse says, the refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. And so the purpose of the fire is again for purifying and refining of us as believers. Uh, and so this should cause us to rejoice rather than fear because it is something that the Lord enables. He allows it and he enables it um, for our benefit and for his glory again. And so he says, approach it that way. Again, he goes back in verse 14 to a topic that he's touched on several times before and used the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. He uses this word reproach. Uh, to be reproached is the same as to be reviled. That term, we talked about it when the Lord Jesus Christ said when he was reviled, he reviled not again. Uh, that means to be trampled underfoot by the world. It's not just someone making fun of us uh, or a little light jesting. Um, it is to be trampled underfoot by the world, to be thought of as worthless, something that's not worth their time. The world will treat us as they did the Lord. In fact, the Lord says himself in John 15, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And so we are hated for the name of Christ. We're hated for the name of Christ. We've identified ourselves as his, that we belong to him. Uh, and because of that, we are hated, mocked, persecuted, and killed for his name's sake. There's no rejoicing or deliverance when you suffer as an evildoer. Peter is very clear about that. Net, net, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busy, busybody. If you suffer because you are one of those people, you're receiving what you deserve. But if we are reproached or reviled for the name of Christ, uh, it says there that we are blessed. We are blessed. Um, <clears throat> verse 17, we get the reminder again that we have resources that are available to us as believers. <clears throat> Peter reminds us that if we suffer for our faith in Christ, we are not to be ashamed. And I think Peter, of all people, uh, knew the shame of betraying the name of Christ as he did on the night of the arrest of the Lord Jesus Christ. He would never, ever be ashamed of the name of Christ again. Um, there was a deep and sad and searing lesson that he learned there. And so he can say we can we will never be ashamed not to shame, be ashamed for the suffering for the name of Christ. The reward, rather, is the reward of our faithfulness. We see it in verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Uh, and so we are committing our souls to the creator, the all-powerful one who created all things by the word of his mouth. And there's no safer place us, for us as believers than in the hand of the creator, even or especially in death, uh, if we come to that point. And in chapter two, or rather in, in second Peter, uh, Peter will begin talking about his soon coming death as well. And so we see those two things that are tied together there, serving and suffering, and very often they're found together. But let's go to chapter five, and we'll begin reading. Uh, Peter changes tack slightly here, uh, although the thoughts are continuing, but he changes tack slightly at the beginning of chapter five. So let's read there from verse one. It says, the elders who are among you, I exhort. 
I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. And may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So our thoughts turn from, from uh, service, from, um, from serving, from suffering, to shepherding. And so he's talking to those who are in oversight, those who are over others, uh, especially in the in the body of Christ, in the local church. And so he calls on the those that are shepherds, first of all, for humility, to display humility. And so he has a very special message for those that lead the flock of God. He calls them the elders who are among you. And I think that's a very important thought there. They are not seated high above the sheep, but are to be found among the believers. Peter regards himself as one. In fact, he calls himself a fellow elder. And so he himself did not aspire to greatness, did not aspire to position, even though as an apostle, he had authority. Uh, but he said, I'm a fellow elder and I serve among you and among the people. And so even though he had this position, this high position as an apostle, uh, he did not hold himself above even the other elders, uh, let alone the people. And of course, this is a great argument for those that claim that uh, Peter had a special position, a special uh, high honor position. Humility is the first thing that we want to see in those that shepherd. The second thing we talk about, Peter looks back here to his experience as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. First, as a witness of the Lord's suffering, both Peter and John state that they were eyewitnesses of Christ. And when we think of an eyewitness, we call we think especially of one who's called to testify. Uh, if there are two people saying this happened, another person says that happened, but there was an eyewitness, that person will be called to testify, especially when there's a dispute. And so here, as a, as a believer, uh, he said, we were eyewitnesses of the glory uh, of, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the glory that would one day follow. And so the part of the responsibility of one who has seen so much and been blessed so greatly is the desire to shepherd and feed the flock. This was, of course, the responsibility that was given to Peter and to the other disciples that morning on the beach when the Lord came back, restored Peter after his betrayal, and gave him a, a new responsibility. Feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And so, but he also said that to the others, that the other disciples that had come. And that's our responsibility as believers, that we too would look from where we've come from and how much we've been blessed and how much God has given to us, that we might have a responsibility to feed others and to care for others, to shepherd others as well. And so we see his heritage there. 
And then finally, in this first part, in verse 3 and 4, we see harmony. Harmony in the local assembly. That's the goal. And certainly harmony amongst the, uh, the elders. It says here, there's a need for elders to lead by example, not as masters or lords or superiors. Um, I think one of the things that we can appreciate about those who are in oversight, those who are in leadership above us, there is nothing more thrilling for us as the body of Christ to see those who are in leadership live out their faith in front of us. Um, remember the Lord uh, condemned the Pharisees because they laid laws, more and more laws upon the people, but didn't even live up to those laws themselves. And so here he's saying again, don't lead by, by decree or, or command or instruction, lead by example, uh, show your leadership. And so this would be a humility in all things, making harmony and unity a priority in the local church. They would take joy in the spiritual growth and maturity of believers uh, and faithfulness to God in all things. We want those who serve in this role of leadership uh, to be faithful to the word of God, to know that they are leaning on the Lord and for his will to be done in our local uh, assemblies, uh, local churches as well. And so, again, we see here, uh, Peter points out uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who has done this. He points there, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Uh, and so, again, we don't seek the glory in this life, but one day we will rejoice to be with our Savior, and he will crown us with glory, uh, with his glory. And so, a role for the shepherds. We want those who are out front uh, to be uh, leading uh, ex by example and shepherding by example. And then he talks about young people. This is always one of those hard, hard ones. I <clears throat> I often know when I was much younger, uh, we would often read these verses and it seemed very targeted. Well, of course they were targeted. They were targeted to the young people. He says, likewise, in the same way as the elders submit to the Lord, those that are younger are to submit to the leadership of the elders. Uh, Peter had instructed the elders not to lead as lords who roughly command those below them in an arrogant or a cruel way, but he also calls on those who are younger to serve willingly. That's a hard thing sometimes for young people, and I remember in my own life uh, when I was a teenager and even older than that, it's hard sometimes to say, I, I will submit willingly uh, because I don't agree with something or I don't agree with the way something is happening. Uh, submission is not about doing, uh, submitting only when we agree with it um, or it goes our way. Submitting is submitting. And so uh, he calls on the young people to do that. <clears throat> Peter gives a great illustration of what that looks like when he says that we should be clothed with humility, clothed with humility. Um, this word clothed has been used by uh, Peter already back in chapter one, where he talked about believers girding up the loins of their minds. And again, the, the, the intent there was that they act like Christ did, um, uh, be of the same mind as the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, who, who humbled himself uh, and took upon himself the form of a servant. <clears throat> it was a very deliberate act, a conscious act of obedience being clothed with humility. And of course, we see a wonderful example of this in John chapter 13, when the Lord uh, himself wrapped a towel around his waist and began to wash the disciples' feet. He took upon himself the form of a servant and modeled for them, demonstrated to them what service to others might look like. And of course, we remember Peter was the one who said, no, uh, I will never have you wash my feet. And the Lord said, if I don't wash your feet, you can have no part of me. And so <clears throat> serving others, we need to learn to uh, serve, but also to be served by others. <clears throat> Excuse me. We see also here in these verses, in verse, um, in verse 5 <clears throat> and then in verse 6 as well, uh, we see a warning for us. Peter quotes uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34, about God resisting the proud. Um, the arrogant uh, mock God and God holds them in derision. 
If we go to Proverbs 3.34, we read there that God scorns the scornful. And if, if we're going to mock, if we're going to resist um, this uh, role of submission, <clears throat> we said we see here that um, that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Um, we see the same verse again in James chapter 4 and verse 6. Pride is one of those things that um, sometimes it creeps up on us. Sometimes it's something that we want. We take pride in what we do, and then we want our glory for it. We want to be recognized for it. But it's, pride is one of the most damaging traits that a believer can hold. And so we, we read these uh, warnings about pride throughout the Word of God, the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Proverbs again says, when pride comes, then comes shame. Uh, and also in, in Proverbs 13, again, it says, by pride comes nothing but strife. So no good thing <laughs> comes out of pride, pride of self. <clears throat> we can be proud of others, uh, and certainly um, we want to be, but pride of self is a dangerous thing for a believer to, to have. And then in verse 6, uh, we're reminded of the sovereignty of God and, the, and his power when Peter refers to the mighty hand of God. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Now, there's a warning there as well. Uh, <clears throat> God loves the humble. And so the instruction is to be humble or to expect God to humble you. Either way, we'll be humbled, we'll be made humble. But God, and God was using persecution in a way to keep them humble in order to glorify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes God allows things to come into our, into our lives, <clears throat> even things that are not directly connected to us, but they bring us down, they, they humble us. And that's probably a very good thing, something that we probably need uh, in our lives from time to time. Um, the promise is that those that humble themselves to God, he will exalt to a place of privilege and honor. And he will honor those who honor his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. See that in, in our submission, our service. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry for coughing again. In these next few verses, um, these are great verses. And I, I love these ones because having talked about um, the need to be living a, a life of submission, uh, how do we do that? In verse 7, it says that we are to cast all our cares upon him, for he cares for you. And so really what we're talking about here is living a surrendered life. <clears throat> Excuse me. Living a surrendered life. Um, when we cast our cares on him, we're surrendering these cares, these concerns, the things that trouble us, the things that weigh us down. We're surrendering, surrendering those to the Lord himself. One writer has likened the casting of our cares upon him to the disciples who were casting their garments onto the uh, animal that was going to um, the Lord was going to ride uh, on into the city of Jerusalem back in uh, Luke 19. They, it says that they cast their garments on the colt. Use this exact same word again. And Vincent, in his word studies, <clears throat> emphasized the point that these were not just any garments, but their garments. It was their personal property, not something that they had borrowed or loaned or taken from somebody else, but they had surrendered. It was their full surrender of themselves and their materials. Another writer has used an illustration of that casting of your cares upon the Lord. Uh, used the illustration of making a deposit into a vault. In other words, we're transferring the ownership of our cares and our worries and our concerns to another. We no longer have, have the ownership of that. That's a very hard thing for us to do sometimes. We always try to hold on to those. Even as we surrender them to the Lord, we say, I'm, ha I'm handing this over to you, Lord. <clears throat> you deal with this. You take care of this. Still, a part of us will hold on to it. But he says, cast them, uh, cast your cares upon him. We all have concerns. I mean, as we go through our prayer list, we know we've got concerns. Uh, in fact, if we were to go privately with each of you, you could probably come up with a dozen concerns <clears throat> and cares that you have in your life. But God said, give them to me 
because you as believers, my people, my children are my concern. And what a blessing that is to us. The second thing we see in these verses, verses eight and nine, is we're having been encouraged to cast our cares on the Lord. Peter reminds us that we cannot drop our guard. Uh, it doesn't like we've surrendered an hour of sitting with our feet up somewhere and not paying attention. Uh, we still have an enemy, an adversary, and our adversary is a predator. He uses the illustration here of a roaring lion looking for who he was able to devour. And so we're called to be sober-minded or serious and vigilant or watchful. Sober-minded means to be mentally self-controlled and is almost always coupled with vigilance. <clears throat> um, uh, J.B. Nicholson or Boyd Nicholson, he makes this point, which I think is a nice, interesting way of thinking about this. Spiritual sloth and sleepiness is an invitation to attack. And so the enemy knows when we're weak. It knows when we're not paying attention. It knows when we're troubled. Uh, and that's the point of attack. And so the call to action here for us as believers is to resist the devil. We should be steadfast in the faith. And of course, we acknowledge that we don't have sufficient strength in our own selves. We don't have the, uh, the moral authority uh, by ourselves to withstand the devil. But we do have the promise of the internal indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In James chapter 4, verse 7, we get that same uh, verse. And you see the order there. It says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And so submission to God is first. And then we resist the devil, the devil with the power of the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. And the devil will flee from us. And lastly, Peter, in this uh, section reminds us that we're not alone in this. Uh, other believers are suffering and resisting in just the same way. And I wanted to just, there's an, there's an interesting thought here, and, and I've got to keep an eye on the time because I don't want to run away with the time. But there was a story that I heard many, many years ago uh, of a fellow who had stopped going to church. He told the people that were there, I can worship God anywhere. I can worship in my home. I can worship wherever I am. I can worship the Lord. Um, and, and bit by bit, he stopped coming to church and less and less they would see him until it had been many months he hadn't been there uh, in fellowship with the believers. And so a couple of the elders went to see him on a cold winter night. They knocked on his door and he answered the door and he invited them in. And he had in, in, his, uh, in his living room a beautiful fireplace and uh, fire was burning there. And there were some chairs uh, surrounding the fireplace. And these three men, uh, the man and the two elders, sat down in front of these chairs. And for a long time, nobody said anything. There was no small talk. There was no chat, uh, no idle uh, thoughts. Uh, they just sat and stared into the fire. And at one point, one of the elders took the tongs that were there by the side of the fireplace and he lifted one of the glowing embers out of the fire and put it on the on the uh, hearth uh, right there next to the fireplace, but out of the fire and just said without a word, just put it down and just left it. And as they then began to talk, they began to talk about spiritual things. They began to talk about the Lord. <clears throat> little by little, they saw that glowing ember that had been burning so brightly begin to uh, to go out. It began to grow cold. And over it formed this sort of coating of ash. And eventually the fire was gone out from it. And again, without saying a word, that same elder just picked up the tongs, took that small ember that was now cold, placed it back into the fire. And before long, it had burst back into flames and was burning brightly again. And so there, knowing that there are others like-minded uh, who are sharing in the things that we need to be sharing in, uh, the fellowship of believers is something that will keep us strong, that will keep us steadfast. And so there's very good warning in that, uh, knowing that others are going through the same thing with us. The last part here we have in verse 10, there's a wonderful verse. These two verses are great uh, and especially great comfort for us as believers. If we've been going through trials, it first of all refers to the God of all grace. And so our we know if we were to go around the uh, the Zoom call here, we know that every one of us have gone or are going through trial or will be going through trial. 
And they come to us in different ways, in different severity, sometimes very little, sometimes a lot. Sometimes it's almost enough to overwhelm us, uh, almost enough to drive us to our knees. <clears throat> but we are comforted that no matter what trials we have, God's grace is sufficient, again, in quality and quantity for us. And because God has saved us through his Son, we have confidence that we have an eternal glory awaiting us, even if we have to suffer for a while, as Peter <clears throat> remarks here in, in that verse 10. <clears throat> but I want to just uh, focus for a couple of minutes uh, before we go to the salutations, the closing thoughts uh, at the end of this, on these four wonderful promises that we have at the end of verse 11. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> these should encourage every believer. It says, the God of all grace will perfect establish, strengthen, and settle us. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to have a little drink. Apologize for all the coughing. The first one we see here is to perfect. Uh, and sometimes we see that word perfect and we think something that is made perfect. And of course, that's never going to happen to us. Not as long as we live on this earth, we will never be perfect. But again, Vincent in his word studies uh, <clears throat> says he describes this as putting all of the parts into the right relation and connection. And he mentions a couple of other places where we might find this in Scripture. The first one we find is in Matthew chapter 4, verse 21, the same word, perfect, is used in a different way, and it refers to the mending of nets. We think of fishermen that are going out day after day after day, and they're throwing their nets into the water, and they're dragging them along the bottom, and fish are getting caught in them, and uh, large numbers of fish are being pulled in. And eventually, some of those nets begin to give way, and they have to be repaired. They have to be restore, restored. This is the same thought there, is the perfecting or mending of the nets. <clears throat> the other place we get it is in Galatians chapter 6, and it's the talk of restoring an erring or sinning brother, one who has stumbled or fallen in his walk. And it talks about those who are spiritual and gentle among you restore such a one. And the same thought there is to bring him back, if you like, uh, so that all the parts are in the right relation and right connection and right connection to each other and to God himself. And so that's something that certainly we want. There are times when we may feel broken in life. We feel that we've been beaten and battered by so many things. We need that perfecting, that mending and that restoring that comes to us. And God promises it. The second thing we see here is the word establish or establish. And this word is used 13 times in the New Testament. Um, it's translated different ways, but the word in the original is used 13 times. The first time we read it is in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. And it's used of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And so that is uh, the idea behind that is that there was no turning back. The Lord had set his face on the way that he was going to go, and there was no turning back. He was established. He was firm in the things that he was about to do. <clears throat> the next one we read is strengthen. And um, strengthen is a fairly common thing. Uh, Paul talks often about being strengthened in our faith. Peter does, and, and, and John does also. Uh, the Lord talked about it as well. But um, this use of the word, again, is the only occurrence that we find of it. And it's translated strengthen, but it's the only time that word in the original is used in the New Testament. <clears throat> again, it was thinking about, in a sense, restoration. And probably Peter was reminded more than any other, again, of his betrayal. When the Lord prophesied to Peter that he would deny him, the Lord spoke to him before the crucifixion, even before they had gone out, that this night you will betray me. And the Lord said, and, and Peter said, never, <clears throat> I'll never betray you. And in Luke 22, we read an interesting verse, <clears throat> excuse me again, an interesting verse that the Lord was already praying for Peter's restoration, even before his betrayal. In Luke 22, verse 32, the Lord says to Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. 
And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. And so the Lord prayed that he would not fail, knowing that he would fail, because he says, when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. <clears throat> and that's the work that the Lord did after the, um, after the resurrection, when he met them on the beach that morning. And he restored him. He, he strengthened him uh, for, the, for the journey to come, the things that would come in the future. The last one we have here is the word settle. Now, some translations don't include that word. Uh, we do find it in the King James and the New King James. But that word settle uh, really sums up the other three words that we've talked about to perfect, establish, and strengthen results in someone being settled, settled in their faith. Again, W.E. Vines defines it as to lay a foundation course that is a certainly a new testament teaching we find that often um, the example used most often is in matthew 7 and we're all familiar with that story that the lord told about the one man who built his house on the sand and the house collapsed and the other who built his house on a firm foundation on a rock and uh, and it would never collapse and so we've got that thought there of the solid immovable foundation something that would not be um tripped up uh, even it, through fiery trials or for uh, suffering through a little while. The writer Bengal has a helpful note on this verse. He says that, that the Lord shall perfect that no defect remain in you, shall establish that nothing may shake you, and shall strengthen that you may overcome every adverse force. And so if we have gone through suffering or are going through suffering or are about to go into trial, and it seems like it's almost always one of those things. Um, the Lord will perfect us. He will strengthen us. He will establish us. And those are wonderful things to hang on to. Lastly, and we'll finish up with these uh, couple of thoughts here. Uh, we think of the three men uh, of uh, that we know of here uh, and, this, and the, um, uh, the descriptions of them as we read them. Uh, the Apostle Peter sends his his uh, greetings from these different men. He talks first of all about Silvanus, who we believe is Silas. He's referred to in other places, both as Silas and Silvanus. He was a, um, a partner with the Apostle Paul in much of the work. Uh, he was sent originally uh, with um, Barnabas to, uh, to Antioch to settle the people, but he was always referred to as a faithful man, a man characterized by faith. Um, the other one that we see here is um, is the uh, sorry I said Barnabas I mean uh, Judas uh, Barsabbas uh, and Silas these were called leading men among the brethren and so Peter had partnered with Silas in the writing of this letter um, <clears throat> that he was sending out to people the second one we see here Peter sends greetings from Mark my son he refers to him as Mark my son most likely, we believe, he's talking about John Mark, the one who had traveled with uh, Paul and Barnabas as they had gone, and there had been a falling out between Paul and Barnabas because John Mark wanted to turn back. And so very discouraging for Paul, but later Paul was able to say, this man Mark is of great value to me. And so uh, the fact that he refers to him as my son, uh, even though it may have been physically and biologically his son, we believe it was a term of affection used for this man, Mark, the one who wrote the the um, the epistle or the gospel of Mark, uh, the one who actually uh, transcribed the life of Peter. That's what most people believe the book of Mark was. Um, Mark took notes from the things that Peter had told him about uh, the years that he walked with the Lord and then wrote the, um, the gospel of Mark. And he talks of him as my son, one that he had great affection for. <clears throat> um, and then lastly, Peter, we see here, and I've skipped over, you'll probably notice it says in verse 13, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you. Uh, we don't know who that is. I know in, um, I think it was in uh, Second uh, John, uh, there is a reference to um, uh, the, the elect lady. Uh, but we don't know here if Babylon is the old uh, country of Babylon that they were taken into captivity. Uh, Babylon is not really mentioned as a country in the New Testament. Uh, some refer to it perhaps as being Rome. Many people called Rome Babylon in the um, uh, later on in Scripture. 
Uh, and so we're not really sure who that reference is to there. But it says here that Mark greets you. Um, my son, Mark, greets you. And lastly, we see here from Peter. Peter, the apostle, ends his epistle uh, referring to the peace uh, that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 14, 27, we read the words of the Lord Jesus himself when he says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And I think this is a great way to end this book that has talked so much about suffering and submission and glory and service, um, is that we can take the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give you. And then let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. For any who's going through difficult and trying times, we want to have hearts that are not troubled. I'm going to leave this thought with you from J.C. Ryle again. Uh, true Christianity is not merely believing a certain set of dry, abstract proposition. Uh, it is to live daily in personal communication with an actual living person, Jesus Christ. And so that's the goal uh, of our salvation, is that we might enter into this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who saved us. <clears throat> And so that brings us to the end of chapter one. Uh, next week, we're going to look at the, well, not next week. I think we've got two weeks in a row where we have uh, missionary awareness meetings uh, back to back, the last week of April and the first uh, Wednesday in March, in, in May rather. And so we won't have our study the next two weeks, but we will meet again uh, when we come back that second week in May, Lord willing. Um, so let's spend a couple of minutes if we have, if anyone has any comments uh, or questions, um, uh, corrections, <laughs> any of those things, uh, this will be a good time. We can open this up for discussion and then we'll try and leave a little bit of time for us at the end if we want to um, spend some time in prayer together and go through at least some of the things that are on our very full list. <clears throat> maybe we could ask that first question have you received a gift a spiritual gift and how do you know uh, what that spiritual gift is well Terry I learned something a, a long time ago from some of our pastors and elders they said just get involved in the church and don't worry so much about whether you're gifted at any one uh, at any one thing uh, but see ways that you can involve be involved in other people's lives and over time it'll become clear to to everyone um, how God has gifted you mm -hmm. so I've always appreciated that. I, I remember how I first became a deacon. There was, uh, it was just a series of events where something needed fixed and uh, the elders were there. And about two or three times this happened in a row, the lead elder came by and said, I, I think we see God working in a certain way. So I know that that, uh, that office is not a gift, but just that idea, just be involved in whatever ways that you can find to impact others. Right, right. Yeah, I think that I think you're right. <clears throat> I think that God will make it clear uh, later on. We don't suddenly get this, you know, flashing light in heaven <laughs> that tells us this is your gift. Um, but I think God does uh, reveal it uh, over time and perhaps even begins to develop other things. Or maybe we get a greater appreciation of something. Uh, you know, maybe it's something that that God wants us to do that we haven't really thought about uh, in the past. I know years ago there was a, a book written um, when I was uh, when we were still working at Loazo way way back in the many years ago twenty years ago and um, it was I think it was called like discovering your your spiritual gift 
And it was a whole series of exercises that you could go through. And it was pretty well received by, by many people. But, you know, the, the challenge is that sometimes, like any of those personality tests, is that you begin to try to um, outthink the test. And so you're trying to get to a certain place um, instead of being honest. And I, and I think it's even we can be dishonest or not even we can be self-deceived in wanting something, wanting a gift to be something and um, and kind of leaning that way. And, um, you know, not that it would be a gift. I think musical musical ability, I think, is a wonderful talent and wonderful ability. And I think it can definitely be used for, for the Lord's uh, glory. Um, but I have heard people that have said that they have a gift um, of music um, and it becomes very obvious when they begin to sing that they do not have the gift <laughs> of music. <laughs> but, um, you know, I guess they make a joyful sound, but, but yeah, I, so yeah, we don't want to, we don't want, I think what you're saying, Kim, is a good, is a good way to go. Let the Lord make it clear you know, what is, and maybe through others, reminding you that maybe that's not your gift. Um, that would be good. Yeah. I'd written a question there, number three. <clears throat> um, and I think this is something for us to consider. Do you consider it a blessing when you're reviled for the name of Christ? Uh, usually we don't uh, think of it as a blessing. Um have you ever been reviled for the name of Christ? And I would say, just in my own personal capacity, uh, I've certainly been made fun of for being a Christian at different points in my life. Um, but I would never say reviled. I never had anyone treat me uh, so badly that I felt, um, you know, crushed. Uh, and maybe that's more about me than than about um, maybe I just haven't been a very good witness for the lord but um i know that in the world there are many who are reviled there they for the especially for the name of christ not just that they don't like you but they don't like you because you're a christian and will persecute you and and uh, treat you with um, with hatred and so on but i don't know if i would say I, i'm either lucky or not lucky that i've never had that in my life um and I think maybe for me, I think partly that in many ways, it's it's not that hard to be a Christian. Uh, I think it might come for us in North America, but in, in the U.S., I don't think it's that hard to be a Christian. Um, most people will generally tolerate you, although I think they're becoming more intolerant. Um, they just accept that's kind of a weird thing about you, you know, if they don't follow it or don't believe it. Um but certainly there are people all around the world who, if they make a stand for Christ, they definitely um, will be not just reviled, but perhaps persecuted and even martyred as well. I had the experience of um, at, at work and stuff, and I heard a, a person shared with me how it says in James, consider it pure joy. And I laughed and said, are you kidding? <laughs> but it, and it was hard, the environment at work. But I think the people were being convicted. Mm -hmm. I think the mm -hmm. Lord used it as a conviction for them, you know, because um, it was very hard, but I could only do this by the strength of the Holy Spirit that gave me the words and the timing to say what I needed to say, mm -hmm. but it was hard. Yeah, yeah. It is difficult. It is difficult. And I think it's a strengthening thing for us, you know, when we have to go through that. I think mm. it's, we're, we're better because of it, uh, but I'm not yes. sure that we all look yeah. forward. We don't count it as a, a blessing generally, uh, as we read in that verse, that consider it a blessing from God. Um but I think of the verse in Acts, uh, was it was Acts 4 or 5, where the apostles, John and Peter, had been um, arrested and, and so on, and they were beaten and, and sent out. And, and they said, we, we counted a joy, as you say, that we were counted worthy uh, to be um, abused in the name of Christ. Uh, that's, a, that's a very spiritually mature place to be um, for most of us.